to kind of housekeeping rules, there's the Wi-Fi. I told most of you, I think, if you have your laptop, you can go ahead and get it out if you want. The first hour, there's a hands-on session so you can follow along. By no means are you required to do that at all. Um, restrooms are like right out the door that way, I think. Uh, Agenda-wise, what'll happen is I'll give you kind of like a community update and then there'll be this hands-on session and then we'll do like a little break right at the like 10 minutes to the hour depending on how long the exercise goes and then when we come back um, Charles will close us out with a presentation on embracing stupid questions and he'll give us some hands-on uh, tableau from his world so it should be very entertaining how, how many slides is it <laughs> I think I've down to 66. 66 slides. So 66 <laughs> slides in like 45 to 50 minutes. So I, I, I think we should prepare to be impressed. Okay, so um, I noticed that there's a lot of new faces here tonight. So usually how we start this is we do an intro. So this is just me, who I am. I've got my name tag on. I'm Ann Jackson. I like to kind of put my tablet credentials up there just so that you know and if you have questions about the different certification levels and um, if you want to kind of go down that path. I have the desktop certified professional and also desktop qualified associate, but I'm fluent in talking to you about the server credentials or certifications as well. Uh, professionally wise, I call myself a data visualization consultant at Slalom. I consider that to be a, a huge honor for those of you that have known me for a while in the user group. That's something more recent, so I've been able to transition something that I'm completely passionate about into something that I get paid to do. It's not why I'm here tonight. I'm here completely to facilitate the enthusiasm and spread the enthusiasm and passion that I have for Tableau onto you guys. So no pitch here. Um, if you want to engage with me, I do have a personal blog that's completely about data visualization, data analysis. Uh, that's my website, jackson2.com. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Tableau community-wise, social-wise, is really prominent on Twitter. So locally within the Phoenix community, typically we connect through the user group and also we have, a, I'd say the most active thing is probably our LinkedIn group, but if you're ever curious on how you can engage with Tableau globally, the best place to go is Twitter. My Twitter specifically has all of the kind of Phoenix user group shenanigans going on and all the different things that I do related to the community. So it's a professional thing. You can go on and look at it. And I encourage you coming out of this to start going to Twitter. One of the things that I really like about it is you kind of just get like a feed of cool dashboards. So it's like biz candy all the time that you can use if you don't want to go out and tweet. Um, if you want to keep it professional, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn. And there's my email address if you ever want to get in contact with me. So what's on the agenda? I think I kind of spoiled it already, but I'll say it again. Community update, and then get Tableau fit. And really the, the spotlight, the showcase of this evening is after I step away and someone else comes up and, and does better talking than I do. So the community update. Um, first up is the next Iron Viz feed around is live. How many people know what Iron Viz is? I always ask this. We got like two hands, uh, three hands. Okay, how many people have ever been to a Tableau conference? Not a lot, okay, I have. Um, so Iron Viz is the concept of Iron Chef. And Iron Chef, those of you familiar or not, is a battle to the death to cook the best food, right? So it's the same concept at the Tableau conference where three users get up on stage and they have, I think it's time box to 20 minutes, 20 minutes to make the best dashboard ever, and then they're judged in front of um, a group of 15 to 20,000 people, depending on how big the conference gets to be this year, and someone reigns supreme, they get chef coats as, as they participate, that kind of thing. Uh, the way you get to participate is through these feeder rounds where they send out kind of challenges, and then you submit a dashboard or a story, you submit a Tableau workbook onto Tableau Public for this contest and they will judge it. There's some judging criteria. The first one was earlier this year. It was around the new geospatial features, but this one's much more open-ended. It's about um, animals. I think if you read the blurb, it's like, so it's like, Iron Viz goes on safari. It's about flora and fauna and all that kind of thing. So it's really like a nice opportunity to pick any data set you want and 
try to make something beautiful and share it with the community for the chance of that really stressful be on stage for 20 minutes visiting your life out. So I encourage you to do it, or if you don't want to do it, I encourage you to just like track it and see what people are doing out on Tableau Public. In terms of our user group, uh, we do meet every third Thursday. The next meeting is live. It should be July 17th. You can find it at that link. And then this Saturday we have something that's still relatively new. It's called um, our Viz Club. It's from 10 to 3 o'clock. And really what it is is we have a little bit smaller classroom. I think it holds about 30 people. And it's just like a collaborative time for you to get together and do whatever it is you want to do. So a lot of what goes on uh, Tableau-wise, if you get really interested is there's these uh, social challenges that I'll talk more about or if you have like a problem or if you're working on sometimes we have folks who come in are working with like a not nonprofit organization to solve some sort of data challenge so it's just an opportunity for peers us in the community to be in a room um, there's better music than this or maybe similar music to what you heard in the beginning but it's very much just like bring your laptop and it's almost like a you know a, st a study room safe space kind of thing so I encourage you to um, sign up for it. it's very in and out of the door you don't have to be there from 10 to 3 you can be there whenever um, the last time it was really successful we had someone come in who was uh, who made like his first dashboard he had gone from the steps of like most of what he had done had been in like worksheets and just by kind of sitting and like in, in just asking basic questions of people sitting around he was able to develop out a dashboard and get pretty far and there was a lot of sharing of ideas so I encourage you to show up I'll be here um, and then next month in with regards to the user group and this this bubble is really large intentionally because I think about an hour and a half of our two hours is on this giant nebulous concept of Salesforce plus Alteryx plus Tableau just everything so you will get to see what has been described to me as sort of like a problem use case how each of these different components fit into it and how they work together to solve that problem so you'll get to see how Salesforce interacts with Alteryx and how it interacts with, tab with Tableau. And then we'll continue with uh, the series, the, the first part of this, which is just a, a get Tableau fit or like a workout challenge where we actually do like a hands-on exercise. Okay, so get Tableau fit, what does it mean? Can I ask a question? Yeah. I get kind of confused on where I might find um, about the, these meetings, like where you might post any materials or where I might find it. Uh, I have a lot of different sites to go to. But You're right, um, and I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, I usually say this, like the community is a little bit segmented, so Tableau Actual has uh, forums. So if you Google like uh, Phoenix Tableau User Group, they have a forum space for us. Usually we'll post the meeting invites there, like the links. Um, a lot of this stuff gets propagated through to LinkedIn. The videos themselves, when they're posted, they are on my Twitter profile and they stay there and I will transition them to YouTube. And usually, um, the way most people interact with me is through LinkedIn. So you'll probably see it come through your LinkedIn feed or see it in that LinkedIn group. Um, and I, also, we try to, and I, I apologize if I haven't done it, uh, make all of the presentation materials available afterwards. But most of it truly is um, stuff that you can kind of find that's hosted by other people's blogs as well. So specifically, um, these three concepts. As I go through the next slides, you'll see the websites where this content is originally hosted that I'm bringing to this session. Okay, so this whole year we've been doing a segment called Get Tableau Fit. And in my mind, there's three things that that means on how you can get better with Tableau from the desktop perspective or start understanding more about it. And these are three social things that go on uh, virtually. The first one is Makeover Monday. So every Monday, Andy Kriebel and Ava Murray go out and they find um, some sort of visualization that pre-exists and they task the community with redoing it started out with like an ugly pie chart like how would you redo this and that turned into a bar chart so that has persisted every week it's now in its second year so there's 52 pristine data sets to revis out there there are pinterest boards of everyone's dashboards 
it's really nice because you'll see it come through every Monday. Someone will post their dashboard of what they did to revisualize data, and it's always completely different. This past one on Monday was about um, an art collection in London. So it was really interesting. Some people took a perspective of talking about the artists and the progression of the different um, types of works. And some people went really abstract with it and talked about the actual sizes of the pieces of art. So there's a lot you can really do with it. And it's fun because you kind of get to see the, the artistry part of it more than maybe kind of like the enterprise, like I do this for my job component of it. So there's some fun inspiration that you can get out of it. I consider it to be a very safe environment to learn because you have that data set available and you have people in the community there that are um, available to guide you. The second one is also hosted by Andy Creeble. So Andy Creeble is this VizWiz VI guy and then he partners with Emma White on this and it's called Workout Wednesday. I like these because they're a little bit more structured. So what you get every Wednesday is specs on rebuilding a specific dashboard. So usually it's like, hey, here's a dashboard I made for a customer, or here was a question I was trying to answer, here's how I did it. I challenge you to recreate the exact same thing. And they're real sticklers about it. Like if you post it, and this is really nice, so Andy Creeble is a Tableau Zen Master. So if you post it on your Tableau Public, and again, they provide the data, it's Superstore, so there's no pressure to find or share your proprietary data, they make that available. If you post it to Tableau Public, he will absolutely open up your workbook and give you feedback and say, hey, you did this right or you did this wrong. And um, being called out in a positive way with the idea really being to grow and it's nice to see how other people do things. And uh, when we go through the workout this week, what you'll notice is probably how I approach it is gonna be different than how you would approach it and how maybe the solution posted is. And that's just true to Tableau in general. There's multiple ways to solve the same problem. No one is more right than the other. I'm sure we can nitpick when we talk about efficiencies, but when you're just trying to get to the answer, there's lots of different ways to do that. And let me be more specific. So Makeover Monday, if you Google Makeover Monday, you'll find it, but it's makeovermonday.com slash UK, I think. So it's, it's hosted across the pond. Workout Wednesday um, goes in tandem between Andy Creeble's blog, which is vizwizbi.com, and then also Emma White, which is womenindata.com.uk. But again, if you just Google these terms, like I would encourage you to put Tableau after, especially with Workout Wednesday, because you'll get a lot of like uh, power lifters results. Um, you'll find it, and it, it, it's really easy to bookmark. The last one uh, is Viz for Social Good. So again, these all have the kind of the same concept, and the idea is just to get you interacting with the tool. So this is very similar. A data set is provided and the challenge is hey there is a social organization and some NPO out there that's asking for our help to visualize their data and that could be for some sort of project it could be for a conference you name it it's happened uh, the ones that I've seen there was one for UNICEF where the results were actually published in one of their projects one of the more recent ones was a uh, had to do with Latin America. So this is actually a really good opportunity to, if you're, if nothing else, this one should grab your heart, I usually say, because you are really benefiting the global community by providing your perspective and visualizing uh, socially important data. Okay, so that's all the housekeeping. We'll get to the actual workout that we're gonna do. So this is the website, if you just, Google Workout Wednesday, week 22, you should get there. I'll give everyone a minute to head there and I will switch over and I will show you what it looks like. Maybe. Okay. So everyone who wants to participate is ready to participate. Uh oh, what's that hand? Can you put up the login for what? Yes, I will do that. <laughs> Let me go back and get out of this guy. So the Wi-Fi network is guest, and then you'll get to a slash redirect page. Usually it's easier to get to in like Internet Explorer. 
as opposed to Chrome. Um, and it's just all lowercase, Apollo Guest, Apollo Guest. If you're already on the website and you're at the blog post, there is a data set called Minds that you'll want to download. Um, it's just a simple CSV. The, uh, the Wi Fi? Yeah. Yes. No, no, not the data. data set. Data. Oh, Wines. Yeah, so if you get to her blog and you scroll down, she should have a link right here. You can download the data for this challenge here. Okay, so I'm going to kind of walk through these. Uh, kind of the setup a little bit more in detail so that everyone has an opportunity to get the data and then we'll kind of dive into it. So this is how it's usually presented. So as you can tell, Emma kind of says, this week's workout Wednesday is inspired and probably partly fueled by wine. I had this economist infographic shared with me by a colleague earlier this month. It's about the science of wine tasting. So if you look at this, I think you can click on it and maybe make it a little bit bigger. What it is is what I would almost call like a scorecard where we've got wine tasters on the left column and then we've got red wines and we've got white wines and we've got color encoding on if they blindly correctly got the type of grape and the I guess country that the wine came from to be honest with you I'm not like a wine buff but at the far right there is the actual score so like their total results of how many they got correct and we kind of track back to her blog post. She says that she was intrigued by this and wanted to remake it in Tableau. So here is, now we'll go to her Tableau public. Here's the redo in Tableau and what we're going to do, we're going to build out in the next 30-ish minutes. So it's pretty close to what the infographic actually was. We've got the names of the tasters on the left, we've got the grape in the country, we've got the coloration on the uh, scores, we've got the total score results. Pretty much everything is the same and there's some built-in interactivity. So if you click, if I click anywhere on here, so Taster 11 is highlighted and they're also highlighted down there. I'm gonna pause for a second. Everyone who wants to participate, do you feel like you're at the right spot to keep going? Yeah. No. What part do you need help with? Getting, okay. I'm in, I'm in Tableau Public. I'm, yeah. I'm sure my address right. Yeah, so um, go ahead and just in one of your browsers type in uh, womenindata.co.uk. And then she should have, so you can see she's got this um, tagging right here. If you click on that, you'll get to, I believe, all of the historic ones. And we're on week 22 right here. What about everybody else? Has everyone else got the data, is ready to go, started to scope out the blog? Okay, I'll take silence as yes. Okay, so she gives some specs, and this is what you'll usually find in these. So she says my dashboard is 800 by 1,000, recreate it as close as you can. She gives us this hint, which I appreciate, which is I've used a separate sheet for each of the red and white line heat maps and scores. So if we think about this, and this is her redo, sheet sheet, sheet, and sheet. So four different sheets at least, which kind of makes it nice. And then the score should be formatted so when it is a whole number, no decimal places are shown, which she's talking about that far right column there. And uh, when the score has a half point, it should sh be shown to one decimal place. Highlight the taster in the reds or whites also highlights them in the other chart. You can download the data for the challenge here. So I'm going to switch over into Tableau, and my intention as we go along is to kind of talk to you about why we're doing this and what is kind of happening. So going into Tableau, I've selected wines. What I always like to do is preview the data to begin with and see what we got, see how it compares to what she's describing. So here we are, we're on our data source. We can see we've got the taster column, we've got the wine type, 
the name of the line, the score type, and the score. And it does have a lot of decimal places that seem kind of pointless. But for the most part, it's a pretty simple data set, and you should be able to get started right away. OK. So first step from my perspective would be let's go ahead and start pulling out the dimensions that we need for both our rows and our columns. So I'm going to go ahead and double click Taster and see what happens. OK, so I double clicked it. It didn't do what I wanted. It actually aggregated Taster up. If we looked at the data source window, that's because these are just numbers here. And Tableau has read that data in as a measure. Usually when Tableau reads things in as measures, it tries to aggregate things. That's not what we want. So there's a couple ways we can resolve for it. We can right click and we can change it to a dimension. And at this point, it's not aggregating. We've got all of our individual numbers, but it is continuous. So when it's continuous, Tableau is trying to plot it on a continuous axis. If we set it to discrete, we're now getting into those buckets. So this is more like what we want from Emma. So that's one way to do it. That's how you would do it kind of on the fly. Probably the better way to do it is just drag this up to dimensions. So I just drag Taster from the measures to the dimensions to make it that. Now if I double click, it does exactly what I want it to do. So when you think about how you go from making something a measure to a dimension, when we make that transition, we're setting it to not aggregate and we're changing it from continuous to discrete. Same functionality happens when we drag it up. Let's go ahead, and I noticed this, and I think you guys noticed this as well, it's gonna drive us nuts, is that it's got that taster out in front. So let's go ahead and make a calculated field to add that word taster to the front. So I'm gonna call it taster label. And we're just gonna go ahead and type taster with our either single or double quotes, and then we're gonna add the actual field on. For those of you that missed the action that I did, I right click and did create calculated field. We see that it, uh, we get errors because the taster is an integer value as opposed to adding two strings together. We can change that really quickly. We can click on this and we can make it a string. So now it's seeing this as a string. I can add two strings together. I need to put a space right there. Everyone with me so far? I know this is pretty straightforward, but I figure we'll just kind of go through the whole thing. So then next thing is I'm going to drag out that calculated field and switch it. So now we're at the point where we've got that looking good. Speeding up a little bit, we want to have our red wines. We want to have the name of the wine and then the score type. So let's go ahead and just double click on wine. And let's double click on score type and see what happens. So it brought score type out to rows. We don't want that. We want it to be on columns. So I'm just going to drag it up. And that looks more like what we want. The last step would be to filter just to the red lines. This is all just setting up the view. This is all pretty straightforward. OK, I'm going to save this just because I'm. OK, so next step we want to do is we want to build out these squares. And we know that the scores are in those squares. So let's go ahead and double click on score and see what happens. Tableau's brought it on, made a text table, which is not really good Tableau practice, but we'll deal with it. Uh, to get around this, we could do a couple things. So first off, um, right now Tableau's in kind of automatic mode. Let's turn it to square. So we're defining what kind of marks we want. Instead of giving Tableau that capability to determine what it is for us, let's go and decide for ourselves. So let's make it a square. And this is still on the text label, which is not what we want. We want it to be the color inside the square. If I change it, to color, we start to get close. Um, what you'll notice is that the score is continuous, so we've got this color ramp here. What Emma has are discrete color values, and I can tell that because she's got three distinct colors for them, and more importantly, these shapes are not touching each other. They are separated. So what I would do to change that is I would right click on this and take it from continuous to discrete. So notice what changed there. So instead of Tableau filling out that full square space and using that color ramp, we now have individual items, they're individual blocks representing each of the scores and the color is now 
um, set to these different values. Everyone with me so far? Okay. So let's go ahead and adjust the colors. Go in, one is like a dark red, half is like a medium red, and then the zero is like a light gray. Colors don't super matter. Okay. So now we've got this set up. It looks about right. I mean, some things we'll probably have to do is make the boxes a little bit bigger. Um, if we look at what she's got going on, we can see that the tasters are sorted with how many right answers they have, and we don't have that. So what I would do is I would right click on the taster label and go ahead and sort it. And we wanna sort it by a specific field. So let's go ahead and sort it by the score and the sum of the score. And let's put that in descending order. So from highest to lowest. And let's click apply. So now we've got the same order that she has going from 11 down. And if we kind of visually inspected it, we would see the same thing that it looks like there are fewer reds as we get lower. Okay. So. This is pretty straightforward at this point. What I would do is I'm gonna name this, rename this, call it the red scores. Now we wanna do the same thing for the white scores. I would right click, duplicate it. We've got our view set up. The only difference we have here is instead of the red lines, we now wanna to filter to the white lines. Okay. So here's where there's some trickery. So we filter to the white line. So we saved ourselves like six development steps by just duplicating the sheet and having the view set up. We filtered our wine type from red to white, but our scores are discrete and they're still set to that same color palette for the reds. So we have to solve for that somehow. Anybody have any ideas on how we could get around that? Create a copy of the score. Create a copy of the score. Exactly right. That's exactly what I would do. So I'm just going to create a calculated field and I'm going to call it white score. Nothing in it. The only thing in there is the same thing, the word score, you know, the field score. And I'm going to go ahead and have that there. And then what I will do is I'll just drag that on to color. We'll have to change it back to discrete. And now we've got our default color palette back so we can set it up with the whites instead of the reds. So let's go ahead and do that as well. I think, if I remember, it was something like these. Probably won't get the colors right, but we'll pretend. Okay. What's nice is we're already sorted by that score, the same thing, and we've got our duplicated view, and we did it in half the time. So we'll call this the yellow, or the white, the white scores. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. What if you had a whole bunch of these, like let's say 10, and you didn't want to repeat them? Is there a way that you could say uh, if white, then the color is this, this, and this? If red, it's this and this? I'm sure there is. Um, one thing I would say is you want to, how would I say this? When I try to develop, I want to have as few calculations as possible because I'm a human and I'm prone to error. So if we can do it in a programmatic way by just copying that field, that's probably more ideal from my perspective, but I'm sure there's a use case for it and that's completely valid and I would think that that would be possible. Like what you're kind of describing is if, if wine type is this and score is one, then, you know, and so you have multiple lines of code versus this where we kind of just, we duplicated that field and we picked the colors, but certainly it depends on what you're doing it for. Okay. So at this point, let's go ahead and like start making our dashboard. So this is 800, this is 1,000. Let's go ahead and drag on the red scores and the white scores. Put them down there. Um, at this point, we can make the dashboard start to look a little bit prettier, but I typically try to wait till the end because there's more stuff we're gonna put on and stuff we're gonna end up trashing. So let's go ahead and now build out, if we're tracking back towards what she's got, this score at the far right, this total score. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take the red scores and I'm gonna duplicate it because it's got the layout that I want. If I thought about what it has, it has all the tasters on rows. I, I can't see them, but I know they're there. I just don't need these extra dimensions at the top. I needed to aggregate those. So I'm gonna take score type off 
So now we're now doing the math on just the wine type. If we take that off, we should be getting to the point where we're actually adding them all up. And you can see that there. We definitely don't want them to be rainbow boxes. So we'll go ahead and we will switch this to text. And we'll switch that to text as well. And that's pretty much it in terms of how we would get to our red totals. Now what's interesting is when I was looking at this exercise on Twitter, and she even says it, that the decimals is an issue. And if you look at her workbook afterwards, she did a crazy calculation to get around that. She manipulated the strings. But when you look at it in my Tableau, it's perfect. We don't have to do anything. It's set up. I was playing around with this and I noticed a couple things. If we switch this to continuous, our decimals are back. That's problematic. So switching it to discrete seemed to help negate that issue. But I also noticed if you switch it back to continuous and let's say I right click and I format it. So now I'm just going in to that format window and I'm going to format that field. One thing I always do here because this format pane can be kind of a bear is I always click on field to make sure that I'm on the actual field that I'm supposed to be formatting. For some reason, Tableau sometimes gets lost in that process. And I just went in here and I just went to custom. I didn't do anything, I just clicked custom with the intent of, okay, I might have to do something custom here. But the act of just clicking on custom also did that. So I would encourage you, if you have something like this, and this is purely like a vanity thing, but obviously your end user is not gonna look at something that's got four trailing zeros. They're gonna laugh at you. Uh, this is something that you can do, and I would encourage you to try this before you go down the route of like, you know, if it's got a decimal, then do all these things, go from a string to whatever. So try out different combinations, but for the sake of what we're doing, we're good. Just like this, let's go ahead and duplicate that. Let's rename it. Let's do the white totals. And let's go ahead and switch it over to white. And then let's bring those on to the dashboard. Okay. So now I think we're kind of at the point where I would start to build. Uh, one thing I didn't say maybe or talk about enough was how much I admire this visualization because it's not a line <coughs> chart or a bar chart. It's something different but it's still in Tableau and you are encoding data in a very visual way. It's much more impactful than having a table result of those wine tasting scores and you can imagine sharing that with people and then um, being excited to see it. From a use case perspective, I think it could play well if you have like associates and different KPIs as well and it would be really good to spot issues. I've used this sort of um, chart in the past to kind of have like days of the week and just to have not necessarily be as many colors, but have them all be gray and just one be green or red if there's an alert that I need to see. So you have like a box of grays and then there's one red right in the middle. It's really obvious what it is you're looking at. And it's kind of pleasing to the eye as well. So let's trash this whole right side. Just get rid of it. We don't need any of that stuff right now. And let's go ahead and make these entire view. We'll do that for every single thing here. <coughs> ahead and drag this over. Okay. So in terms of build, this is actually really straightforward and now we're kind of at formatting steps. So formatting that I would do, let's right click and hide that and we're going to hide this taster label right here as well. Do the same thing down here. So I'm just right clicking on this header, hiding field labels for columns, same thing, hiding field labels for rows. We're going to do the same thing on these totals. So on those, we don't want to show them, so we're just going to uncheck show header. This is basic stuff here, but pretty nice to kind of think conceptually as well. Like you don't have to have one sheet and get everything in one sheet. It's not necessarily, I would hate to say this and be wrong, but I don't think it's possible to have your boxes and then your wine totals as numbers off to the right. In my mind, you'd have to have them be separate. So be thinking about that. If you have multiple things that you want to show, don't constrain yourself to doing it all in one sheet. That's what a dashboard is for. So you can put multiple visualizations on one page. So we'll go ahead and uncheck the show header there, and we're getting closer. So this is another kind of time-saving step here. 
I've clicked on the red score sheet and I know I want to format it to get rid of the borders. So I'm going to go ahead and go to format, borders, and I like to do all my final formatting from the dashboard because I can see everything. I do the same thing with my tooltips. So we're here, we're just going to turn these off. And the nice time saving tip here is that I do that there. I don't close this, I click on another sheet. This stays open. It's probably hard to see, but these are now filled again. And we're now looking at the formatting for this one. So instead of having to do like three or four clicks to get to the same spot, we're just going to click once down and then go through and do the same thing. And we've got to go over here, same thing. And then we can even change at the top to our shading here and turn off our banding. Okay. So that's pretty much the basics of the build. There is a last step, which is to do, let me hide these titles, the key or the legend for the score. So if we go back and we look at what she's got here, and let's click on a title public, it's a little bit bigger. She's got a box for each one at the top. She's got correct, partially correct, and incorrect. I'm going to pause here and I'm going to ask, is there a volunteer from the audience who wants to come up and do this last part? No? You will? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll be here. I'll be standing next to you. <laughs> I started crying and no one made fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> I have tissues. Okay. So hopefully you saved this too, but. Yeah, oh, you're fine. So you want me to go back into Tableau and just kind of replicate yep. this stuff up here? Yep, just that guy. There you, are. you took away the filters, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not using the color legends that it comes with. So basically what I'm doing is highlighting this area the way I would do it is I would look for filters and see which filters I want to <laughs> use. So, and I can't remember what uh, is it the... Which one is it? It is, so we're looking to find, we're looking to make or show a color legend for the um, scores. Score types or just scores? Just the scores, the sum of the scores. Okay, so that's not showing up in here, right? Yes. Does so so anyone want to help from the so audience? Got to go to the so legends. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's see what's in legends. So you're in the right spot. It's just one above that filters in the menu. Okay. So let's see what that does. Gotcha. Okay. So then, thank you. Then what I would do is kind of it was a it was above, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's two. Two different ways I would do this actually, and I have to kind of toggle back and forth, forth here. She obviously has it on top of this thing, so can't really tell at this point in time whether she's got. No, I can't Let's see. There's two ways to do it. One is to do it as a floating, okay, or a fix. So right now I'm trying to fix it into a spot. So right now I've got these sitting here and I range items single row I've got that so far right okay and it's no range items again um help me out format I'm trying to yeah. format them to the right format the title. And what am I doing wrong to format the uh, legends? Anybody know? You guys want to help them out? I think you need to create a new sheet. Okay, so Jeff thinks you need to create a new sheet. Why do you think that, Jeff? Because uh, if you look at it, um, it's its own little uh, function within. The color legend is not part of a 
kind of legend that comes with the worksheet. It's, it's customized where it's much different than what the Talpo gives you. The values can't be inside the legend itself, yeah. so you need to create a table of legend sheet. Yeah. All right, okay, so <laughs> come on, guys. Jeff, come up and I make the legend sheet. <laughs> so I wouldn't have even thought, like, to be honest with you, I usually don't have color legends, and so a lot of what you're doing in terms of arranging them to a single row, those are things I typically do very often, so it's really nice to see that capability for someone who may do that more and, and talk through how you might resolve for it. All right. Uh, we're going to have an army up here by the end. There's going to be everybody up here. This is great. This is truly a collaborative visualization. So, Jeff, don't go too fast. I'm <laughs> trying like I did. I mean, right. And at least tell us what you're doing. Okay, so we know that each box represents the actual uh, score. So, uh, what I'm going to do is go in here, bring the score over just to kind of see what it looks like. The screen. Is it score type? No, it's just the score. So I'll bring this over as discrete. So it'll give me the three different values. And I'll make that as a square, and then we know that this, the number is inside the square. So I'll, what I would do is I'll go ahead and just drag that as a line label. And then um, we also need to define the color of each square. And then, it looks like the score is inside the box. So I'll help you out here. If you center it, if you center it on the label, when you bring it onto the dashboard, there should be enough space. Got it. All right, so I should modify the colors. Had it on red, right? Mm -hmm. So zero is gray. And then you have your pink, and your one is the dark red. Now we'll just take a look at it of what it looks like as of now. I did, I'm Burn. sorry. <laughs> no offense taken, believe me. <laughs> I've never thought of building as a sheet. Making a sheet? Is that how you were? Mm -hmm. yeah. Looks like we'll need to bring a text over. Just so you know, guys, this is not how I did this either. So Jeff is way different than my approach, but it looks like it's working out so far. So he's made another text, he made a text box to the left of that sheet. Focus on the legend, Jeff. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we want to see. Okay, so we want to put a label on top of that. Ooh. Okay, so let's see. Um, Oh, okay, so I've got to do a case statement. Okay. So you're, you're building... Help, help you. So what I'm doing is I'm building a case statement because I want to have a label for different scores. So for one, I want to have it return correct. For 0.5, I want to return partially correct. And for zero, I want to return incorrect. So I've got to create a case statement on the score. Uh, I actually didn't do this for this week, so... So you're coming in fresh? I am coming in fresh. Correct. So while Jeff builds out this case statement and you guys were working, how many of you thought that the color legend would be a sheet? How many of you thought it would just be the color legend and that's what it was going to be? Really? Okay. Yeah. So is that okay. to say that you usually don't make custom color legends with sheets? No, not a thing? So what I did is I brought the label over as like my column and it looks like it matches to what uh, 
the challenge is showing. So what I will do is I will hide the label here. And then I'll go to my dashboard and it matches to what they have. You know, we'll get rid of the hide title. Fit entire view. And we can minimize the size later. And that's kind of the not that important. Oh, so the ordering is off because the, these are texts. So what I would just do is drag that over. And now we have your correct, partially correct, and incorrect. Yeah, so um, I think that's kind of one of the hooks in this as well. Like, So there's a couple things. And I think the key takeaway is that break things down into multiple sheets, including the color legends as well if you need to. And, and think about the flexibility that you can have with that. Um, one thing I like to do that what we didn't do here is build out something like this, like the color legend, and then add dashboard actions on it. That's very similar to like using a table and having those be action filters, and that can be probably more performant than if you have a quick filter on your dashboard, because it's only driving that action when you click on the button, and it's more interactive from the end user's perspective. And the last step uh, is pretty straightforward. I will open up probably, if I can find it, go in and I will show you the completed one just so you can see the dashboard action of that highlight step because if you remember the last part it was we wanted to click on any part of a taster and have the whole row highlight in both the red and the white sections so how I would go about doing that is Here's my dashboard actions. I'm going to get rid of this really quickly. And let's just start with the basic, right? So let's say we want to go ahead and dashboard, go to actions. We want to add an action. We want it to be a highlight action. This is where we start. We have no idea what we want to do. Let's just tr build a highlight action. So this is how we start. If we look at the basic functionality, it runs on select. It's going to run on all of the sheets that we've got set up here. If I click OK, let's see how this performs. I'm going to click right here. So it's done a couple things. It's kind of like light on my screen. But what you can tell it's, is that the row isn't highlighted. You get this highlighted in the name here, but you're not necessarily highlighting correctly. And the last step to be able to do that is we really want to decide which fields we want to highlight. So within this action, we can customize and say, what are the target fields that are going to cause this highlight to occur? And the only one we really want to check <laughs> is the taster name, which I think was taster label when we built it out. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And now let's see what happens when we highlight. So now it's doing the right thing. So it's kind of the last step in the process. If you get to the point where you're highlighting and it's not highlighting what you want, or the same thing with a filter, go in and customize which fields you want to set up. And when you talk about, this is kind of going off script here, but when you talk about dashboard actions, something that people don't necessarily know in the beginning is that you can make uh, dashboard filters go from one dashboard to another dashboard. So it can be really powerful where you have, you click on a box on dashboard one and it filters stuff in dashboard two and it will take you there as well. So when you talk about driving people through the process, think about that and how you can have a very interactive, very drill through experience without having as many quick filters on the left and it's a really pleasant experience for your end users. Hey, I have a question on that. I, I created a dashboard where I copied and duplicated it, mm -hmm. but I couldn't disconnect. So when I started doing filters on the original one, it continuously updated on the other one. Is, is that where you would disconnect that? Yeah, I would. So the actions, they can be tough sometimes. Like you see right here, like these are the names of the sheets. So sometimes like if you're saying, like these are the action, these are the sheets that you click and these are your target sheets and the action's gonna happen on this. It may be a better practice to duplicate that sheet and have it be separate. That way it's disconnected from that same action. You may need to go that route. Yeah, I tried that and it still was connected somehow. I couldn't get it disconnected. Like what I always do, so it's it's too easy. Tableau makes it too easy for 
you as an individual, and it looks really cool, to just click this like filter button which filters everything, I encourage you not to do that. It's great for data discovery, just exploring and kind of deciding what's going on, but as soon as you're gonna build out your dashboard actions for longevity, I would start, just go to dashboard and build your actions from there. Really be deliberate in what you want to occur. And I think that that will help eliminate some of that. And plus it kind of, it bypasses the terribleness of what your coworker is going to find after you leave, which is this ugly filter one generated. And they're going to be really unhappy with you because you'll have 50 generated filters. You have no idea what they are. You're going in three sub menus to figure out what action is persisting. You can get really lost in the process. Okay, so pulse check. Who thought this was super easy? You can be honest. No one? Really? Okay. I thought it was easy. Um, who likes the individualization and thought it was different than what you've probably traditionally seen in Tableau? Yeah? Can you guys think of use cases for it, kind of beyond what I described? Cool. Um, what were some of the best takeaways or new things that you saw going through the build? Sean? Going with me? Um, yeah. The takeaway, the thing that I liked was the uh, building the, uh, the legend. Okay. Uh, the sheet and have it be actionable. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Any other feedback, thoughts on that? <clears throat> we do something similar. We've done something similar with that with our. Oh, if you want a document like the filters mm -hmm. in a in the dashboard, we created a separate sheet and then put all of the uh, all of the fields that were used so you could you could install them out as a sheet as a like a footer for each of our dashboards so you could see how everything was filtered. Oh, so almost like kind of like a breadcrumb or something through like what you've got selected. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have like multiple multiple filters, if it's something that's being printed out or, or shared, mm -hmm. if, you know, a person would immediately know how that how that how uh, the data's been filtered. Was filtered. That's really cool. Yeah. I think um, there's a lot of I'd like to see that because that seems nice. Like especially if someone does a screenshot or something or shares it, and it's like, how do we know that they're looking at the same data? Because you know what's going to happen is you're going right. to you're going to send an email with a screenshot. Someone's going to go to the dashboard and be like. Your data's wrong. You know this isn't right, and so that's a nice way to get around it. So that's a that's a good idea. And just another question: You went pretty quick on when you put in the score sheet. Did you do something to line the, the scores up with the, the rows of the other sheet, or did you just I I I will. Is there a trick to get those two to line up? So here's our build, just for uh, clarity here. The I eyeballed it. Um, what we definitely have going on is the sort is the same, so that's helping us out. That's going to be your best um, case scenario here. What I might even recommend if you're going to like change out the data source, uh, one thing I did was I did this sort on the fly, so this isn't set as default. I would probably go into the field and I would default set the sort if I could, if it lets me, if it doesn't let me then I won't depending on what it is. But that would be another way to keep it and make sure that it persisted. But it was just lining it up. And there was one additional step that I didn't talk about, but we should probably should, which was to get this like score label here, which is just one of my favorite tricks is just type in an ad hoc calculation at the top. This is just a string where I've typed the word score to make it show up as a field. So if you need a measure name at the top or something, you need a column label, Try just doing a single quote and making an ad hoc string at the top and see if that'll get your header to work. Yeah. Another tip related to that would be add a zero if you have continuous ones so that the zero is the bottom axis and there's no data there and then whatever your measure is goes to the top. A lot of people it's easier for them to read top down and see what it is the bar chart is measuring as opposed to going all the way to the bottom and seeing what it is. Or you can get it in both spots that way. Okay. So I think I've kind of gone over time a little bit. So we will network and then let's plan on being in our seats around 7.05 and we will hard start by 7.10 max.